Due Process, winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2014 New York Emmys for our coverage of criminal justice and current affairs. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. You can fight City Hall because those are exactly the words that I was fortunate to say the night the verdict came in and we walked outside. It was more than just a criminal trial. The successful case against Hugh Adonisio, Newark's mob-connected mayor, would bring black power to City Hall. And in a state long known for corruption, usher in a new era of aggressive prosecution. Now, 45 years later, we look back at a watershed event in New Jersey's politics and organized crime on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding from the New Jersey State Bar Foundation and the PSEG Foundation, making things better in our communities. corrupt state in the Union? It was certainly our reputation, and some say well-earned. But 45 years ago, the Feds brought a case designed to change all that, a case that took on two entrenched institutions, the Newark political machine and the Mafia. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. And on this edition of Due Process, we look back on the trial of a Newark mayor, a former member of Congress, Hugh Adnizio. The government said he put his city up for sale with organized crime as the principal buyer. We came in on September 2nd. We had all of them, all of the Newark crowd, under indictment by December 17th. The Newark crowd? Corrupt officials in league with the mob. A mayor linked to organized crime, sent from City Hall to federal prison in a city destined for change. Just three years earlier, Rebellion rocked Newark. 26 dead, hundreds wounded, hundreds more jailed. This can be classified certainly as partly a civil rights uh, demonstration, but I think it, it, it emulates from uh, uh, individuals in the community who are more concerned about themselves, perhaps, than they are concerned about doing something in, in, in relationship to civil rights. But in the aftermath, a governor's panel citing conditions that led to the riot Racism, poverty, the absence of opportunity, police brutality. People were mad and they were angry. And the pervasive sense of official corruption. There was so much corruption that the police was so rampant, the racism was so prevalent. Newark was really going down the plug hole fast. Garrett Brown would later become chief judge of the federal courts in New Jersey. There was a sense that everything in the city of Newark was for sale. And it turned out that it was. But back then, he was a junior member of the team assembled by Fred Lacey, U.S. Attorney, and first assistant, Herb Stern, a team that would change the scope and the pace of the prosecution of public officials. I hesitate to think what would have happened to the state if the Adnesio case and the companion cases had not been brought and won. And what about the city of Newark? How many more elections might Huey have won? Might he even have realized his dream of being the state's first Italian governor? And how much longer would the black and brown majority of Newark have waited to take City Hall? Without the indictment and conviction of Adnesio, Ken Gibson doesn't get elected in 1970. Not in 1970, I don't think. Possibly in 1974. 
The charges against Adonisio and his co-defendants involved kickbacks and theft, bribes and extortion, a partnership between elected and appointed officials and capos of organized crime, a partnership that may even have prompted Adonisio's decision to leave Washington after six terms in Congress to run for mayor of Newark. You, Adonisio, was elected with the overt active help of the Mafia. Mob figures like Angelo Gyp Carlo and Tony Boy Boyardo. In fact, an FBI wiretap caught an Adonisio declaration that would become the linchpin of the prosecution. There's no money in being a congressman, he said, but you can make a million as mayor of Newark. The FBI was listening in on folks like DiCarlo and recorded him saying, Yui gave us the city. DiCarlo, the newer crime boss, played in Jersey Boys by Christopher Walken. He's not going to cut my throat, are you, Frank? <sighs> no, Mr. DiCarlo. A lot of people like to, huh? And though the name was changed, Boyardo, too, got an on-camera role as no less than the model for Tony Soprano. So there we have Gyp DiCarlo singing and dancing in Jersey Boys, and we have Tony Soprano entertaining the world today on television, but in those days, they owned the largest city of the state. And 45 years ago, it wasn't entertainment, though there may have been an element of art. The indictments came in late 69, while Adonisio was running for re-election. The trial began the following June, just two weeks before the mayoral runoff against a civil engineer named Ken Gibson. The big powers of the national and the state people they weren't expecting much, but because we had that whole opportunity to change and get rid of a guy that they had decided was a scoundrel, they allowed that trial to take place because they knew what was going to happen. When it did, instead, when it did. Of, instead of going with the defense and waiting until after the election. Absolutely. They could have granted postponement. Judges could have done it, the prosecutors, whomever. So the Adonisio trial would help bring black power to City Hall and usher in a new era of political prosecution for New Jersey. The essence of the case was uh, people who wanted to do business with the city of Newark had to uh, give kickbacks to government officials. And that's what the U.S. Attorney went after, and it had never been done before in the state, and they were successful, they got a conviction. Within a few months after the conviction, we did Jersey City, Hudson County, Atlantic City, Atlantic County, Two secretaries of state, two state treasurers, each donated two and two by the Republicans and the Democrats. We were an equal opportunity uh, chaser. And so we have a different state today. It was something that had to be stopped if you're going to have a system of government that operates for the people. The Adnesio convictions and the ones that quickly followed didn't end political corruption in New Jersey. We've seen enough ongoing cases and convictions to know that, but it was a game changer, and our guests are here with a why and how. Retired federal judge and former U.S. attorney Herb Stern, as you saw in the field piece, was at the heart of the Adnesio prosecution, while Joe Hayden, founder of the Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers of New Jersey, has had long experience in corruption cases, first as a deputy attorney general and later in his long career on the defense side. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Ray. Um, I think we got to put our viewers in some historical perspective. Joe and I have both appeared before the judge was on the bench and worked with him since, but more importantly, the judge was an adversary to both of our fathers, so he's been around a long time. And some of the things we want to talk about are historically important, and I think no better place to start than with Junius Williams' comments. Junius has been a guest here and is a friend of due process, but he talked about the fact that the trial of Adonisio was taking place as the runoff was taking place for that historical election when black political power began to emerge in Newark through the mayorship of Ken Gibson. Um, were you aware, potentially, of how cataclysmically important it was in political terms for this trial to unfold during the runoff between Adonisio and Gibson? Without a doubt, and not only were we aware of it, but we made sure that it occurred because uh, we had no guarantee that we would be able to convict these uh, fellas. And the, uh, the black population of, uh, of Newark had been under the thumb. As a matter of fact, we indicted him before the first election and now, notwithstanding that we had indicted him, 
uh, Gibson couldn't get a majority. There was a runoff. And the actual runoff was during the trial. And of course, Adnesio wanted out. And he didn't want any trial. He wanted to wait. And, and we, we certainly wanted to defeat that. What kinds of things emerged during the trial that you think had an impact on voters and on people who were looking at work? Well, the vast uh, amounts of money involved in one project, the South Side Interceptor Sewer System, was $10 million. The mob took 10%, $1 million. Now, you're talking about mid-1960s dollars, which is, you know, today would be 10 times that amount. Um, you know, our, one of our principal witnesses was dying of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. We brought the jury up to the hospital. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very interesting, you know. Your dad was, was, uh, was in the case for a while. I was very fond of, of uh, Joe Sr. I, I had tried a case uh, some months before. And uh, I learned a lot from him and from your dad, too. Let me ask this. Does the Department of Justice have guidelines about when, if you're about to bring an indictment and there's a political race, yeah. you may have an impact on it? Does it think through that process and have principles governing when you do or don't do something as dramatic as that? Well, there were no such guidelines in our day. There was debate about these things because people said, look, if you bring the indictment, you may affect the election. But my feeling and Fred's feeling, Fred Lacey's feeling, was very simple. If we didn't bring the indictment, that would have an effect on the election. If a prosecutor has enough information to indict, I don't see how he or she dares not bring the case. Why keep the information secret from the electorate? But Herb, as Junius was saying in the tape piece, there were legitimate requests to delay the trial until after the election had been decided. It seems to me, as you were answering Ray's question, you were saying, yeah, we, we, we knew what we were doing, and we knew it would affect the election. And is that according to Hoyle? I don't know who Hoyle is, but it was a, <laughs> I think it was in the public interest that there be a complete explanation and exposition. How is it in anybody's interest to keep the lid of the sewer closed while the people who were befouling the city ran as though uh, there was nothing, nothing untoward? Joe, you've been on the, both sides of the fence in the sense of being in the AG's office and also representing public officials charged with corruption of one kind or another. Is that something that clients are frequently conscious of, whether or not a trial may adversely affect an election? And is it something that plays into the strategy on the defense side? It is the first thing that a political figure will think about. How will the, these charges affect me politically? Most of the time, it's the reason that an elected official will not step down will not resign because they'll, they feel their power will be weakened. And what I vividly recall about the Adnizio case is Adnizio made a request for an adjournment of the trial the day of the runoff, and that request was denied. Even that one day? Even that one day, the government wanted to go forward, the judge wanted to go forward, so they went forward. And uh, Mayor Gibson won, uh, I think, fairly close in terms of the election. Again, the theory is um, among conspiracy theorists in, in Newark, and we have many, that there had been, as you just said, they didn't expect much from Hugh Adonisio, they being the, the real power people, whether they were the, the business community or they were Washington. They wanted him to keep the lid on, and you'd had cities exploding all over the country, and Newark, he kept the lid on, and so we'll keep him in place. Then the lid comes off in 67, and... Hugh Adnizio wasn't going to survive that. You think that makes sense? Well, I don't think he was going to survive his corruption. I think he could have survived the right. Which is not to say that, that they went after an innocent guy. No, it's well, just to say uh, no. that the when maybe has something to do you, with it. You know, that. things were happening very fast in the 60s. 65, we had Selma, civil rights, the voting rights. 67, we had the Newark riots. 68, we had the assassinations. And in the wake of that, the Governor's Select Commission talked about the pervasive atmosphere of corruption in Newark. I think it's the atmosphere of corruption that Mayor Adnizio could not survive once the investigation of the caliber of uh, Herb Stern and Fred Lacey uncovered the proof and also was able to prove it through some very strategic evidential arguments to enable to get the Cantor testimony in. 
It's the corruption that was the problem, not the riots. I think the riots were something they could have dealt with. Herb, you, you touched on Cantor. Uh, play that out a little bit. So here's a guy who's dying of ALS, and he can't come to court. No. But he's your big witness. One of them. One of your big witnesses. And so you take the entire court to East Orange, to the VA hospital, and d describe the scene there with his wife. It was, sur it was surreal. Uh, the, 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 I mean, it, 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 in one sense it's amusing, but in another sense it's tragic. Uh, Irving was dying. Well, it was certainly tragic for him. Yeah, he was, but well, but the point on... How, it, how does he testify? Well, that's what I'm trying to say. He was, he was, it's a progressive disease in which your muscles just go and, and, and it affects your speech. And in preparing him, it became harder and harder to understand him. And his wife would sit with him, Jane Cantor, she was like a saint. She was with her husband every day in the hospital, every day, holding his hand, even while Jack Bissell, who later became the chief judge of federal court, he was assigned principally to prepare him until I finally got to the, you know, the part where the testimony would be. By the end, nobody could understand him except Jane Cantor. We actually brought the jury up to the Veterans Hospital, and we swore her in as his interpreter. And she sat there, and he spoke. This dying man spoke through the lips of his wife. Pretty dramatic stuff. Did it occur but, I'm to you? I'm sorry. Did it occur to you that maybe she was making it up? Why would you say such a thing? No, I'm only kidding. Of course she wasn't making it up. We had the checks. What the Bob had done is they persuaded Cantor to open a special bank account. And they took uh, the a million dollars in checks from the Southside Interceptor Service System, ran it through his account. He was allowed to keep $100,000 for himself and funneled the money back to Joe B. N. Cohn, <coughs> who was Tony Boy Boyardo, known in real life as Tony Soprano. Uh, we had the checks. We had all the evidence. And but, she knew the facts, but I'm just no, wondering. Well, she didn't know the facts. She was, had, she, she was just interpreting. You think? I know so. Let me put this in, in another kind of historical perspective. I grew up in Hudson County where, of course, the Hague machine was legendary. But there's a line in your book that we were talking about earlier uh, in which you said that in Essex County, uh, the mob ran the, ran the politicians, but in Hudson, it was the other way around. Yes. What, what, was, what were you saying in that context? Well, uh, <clears throat> the mob made Adnizio mayor and owned him. <clears throat> and the tapes proved it. I mean, um, uh, DiCarlo bribed the president of the city council, Bontempo, Mickey Bontempo, not to run against Adnizio and not to split the Italian vote. They're both on tape discussing it, both Bontempo and DiCarlo. So there was no doubt about that. But the tradition in Jersey City, you know, was different. The, 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 from the time of Haig through the time of John V. Kennedy, that was 60, 70 years of encrusted uh, uh, democratic, because it was a city, you know, the cities were the democratic. Uh, corruption and uh, even the municipal workers had to kick back 3% of their pay. You couldn't work as an outsider without kicking back 10%. It was, when we broke it, when we broke it, and we subpoenaed in the records of all the contractors, engineers, and suppliers, and we were looking for the cash, there were days where there were a line of people down the corridor of our office coming in with this subpoena, how much you pay, how much you pay, how much you pay. You, you couldn't work without paying. There was nothing like it in the country. And in what year opinion. are we talking? Um, the year we did it was uh, right after the, actually we started the subpoenas going, while we were on trial with Adonisio in, in uh, 70, we brought down the indictment in, uh, I think it was November of 1970. We were only in office a few months. You moved very quick. Very quick. You moved very quick. Ray, you know, looking back at it, I think that the Adonisio prosecution and trial is the most dramatic and impactful case in my 45 years of being a lawyer. Why do you think that? because it's the indictment of the mayor of the largest city in a conspiracy with organized crime for corruption that involved over a million dollars. But what I find so truly significant, given the benefit of hindsight, is how powerful the prosecution team was. You know, you want to talk about shock and awe. 
you had four of the prosecutors ended up as federal judges. Fred, Herb, Jack Bissell, and, and Garrett Brown, both of whom became chief judges. One of the special state prosecutors was Don Merkelbach, who became a high-ranking state judge. John Goldstein be ultimately became the United States attorney, and you had some other lawyers who were leaders of the bar, and you had a brilliant legal strategist like John Barry, who ultimately was be able to help frame a legal theory. When you put a team like that, and I don't know if a team like that has ever been put together, and what they did, and I was a young lawyer, and, and I'm following it and began to get involved in cases, is they went and, and, and systematic political machine type corruption began to go down like dominoes. But it was because of an investigative method which involved the IRS, which involved intensive interviews, and a team of crack lawyers. But I think the model was started with the Adnizio prosecution. So without Adnizio being prosecuted, without this trial, could you have done Hudson County? Sure. So does the Adne do we overstate it when we say that the Adnizio trial opened the door to this new era of prosecutions, or was it just the first? Mm -hmm. Just it, happened to it, it be the first. Let me, let me put it to you this way. The Adnizio case came first. If we had lost it, there would have been no others. I think you said Fred Lacey would have been driven out of Why do you say that? Out of New Jersey. Statement. Why do you think there would have been no others? You don't stand up and accuse the mayor of the largest mm -hmm. city of the state of being the handmaiden of the mafia. You don't put him on trial through two mayoralty elections. You don't insist that the public understand exactly who they're voting for and what they're voting about and then lose the case and think you're going to stay around town. Joe, were you sensitive to the historical importance of the trial as it was unfolding? No, not, not at the time. You, you were in, remember, you're in the 60s, you had Selma, you had the right, you're sensitive to the political fallout that all of a sudden in 1970 we had our first African-American mayor, Mayor Gibson, was elected. Uh, ultimately, you have to have some hindsight to see how this template was taken for other investigations, for other cases throughout the state. I think what it did do was make the United States Attorney's Office the preeminent law enforcement agency in the state of New Jersey after that investigation. So then we got to put Judge Stern under oath and ask him whether he at the time was thinking about the impact on the democratic process, small d, of trials like this. With two minutes to bring me Yeah. <laughs> Look, I was a kid. I was in my early 30s. The other people in the office, except for Fred Lacey, were even younger. We were idealistic. Uh, we believed in our country. We believed in our process. We believed it was being defiled. And so we were out to try and change it. I had little at stake because I was from out of state. Uh, so was Goldstein. Fred Lacey was one of the leading lawyers in this state. He put his whole life, his whole reputation, his whole practice on the line. As I say, if we had failed, I wouldn't be sitting here now. With 90 seconds left, I just need to ask you, need to pull it up 45 years and say, so, so what has it meant? What has it meant for New Jersey in these last 45 years? And how do, how's our corruption measure today? It, it's hard. Most of your viewers will have no way of assessing the <coughs> accuracy of what I'm about to say. But they'll believe you. I hope they will because I'm telling the truth. Uh, today you have odd instances of corruption. You have odd instances of people betraying their oath. But in those days, as they said in Hudson County, it was a, quote, way of life. It was not only a way of life in Hudson, it was a way of life throughout the state. I first came into the state before all these cases and stumbled on a $110,000 bribe to the mayor of Woodbridge. Woodbridge, a bucolic town. This state today, it's unrecognizable for what it was. And we're going to have to leave it there with our thanks to Herb Stern mm -hmm. and Joe Hayden. Mm -hmm. But you can find us anytime. Our entire Due Process Archive on demand on our website, dueprocesstv.rutgers.edu, or on YouTube. And we hope you'll join us again next week and every week for more important issues of law and justice. Till then, for Sandy, for producer Tanya Bentley, and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching.
New Jersey was a very special place in the 1960s. Um, it had the reputation of being the most corrupt state in the United States. And it was. There's no question about it. The day that Fred Lacey was sworn in as United States Attorney, which was September 2nd, 1969, the United States Senator Clifford Case stood before a half-empty courtroom and said, and these were his exact words, I am tired, I'm tired of New Jersey being a stench in the nostrils of the world. Oh, well, we're certainly not perfect, we have our issues, but the state you have today is nothing like the state of the state in those days. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.